Today on Way of the Master, the team is in Paris, open air preaching in front of Europe's most famous tower. God is good and he's just and holy. He must see that justice is done. We'll hear many different views on the afterlife, as well as the Bible's view on reincarnation. The deception of reincarnation is that there is no day of judgment, no need for the cross, and no need to trust in Christ. What do you think of when you hear the word Paris? You think of the Eiffel Tower or the Arc de Triomphe? The Mona Lisa or the Louvre? You think of delicious food or are you just an uncultured American who thinks only of French fries and French toast? Well, whatever comes to your mind, there's only one thing on the mind of Ray Comfort and the team as they hit the fifth stop on their 13 country evangelism tour, sleep. The Bible says that God's mercies are new every morning. And this morning, that truth has a little extra significance to our team. You see, during yesterday's train ride, someone stole Tony's gear bag with all the audio equipment. Now, that was a hard blow. But the blessing is this. After doing an inventory on all the remaining equipment, we now know that there's enough gear to keep recording. Because the gear wasn't all in the same bag, it was split up among the camera crew. This is great news. This show can go on. Uh, we have volunteers in each country, and we're looking for a translator. This gentleman here is admitted to being a loud mouth to be a translator today. Now, this is our fifth day. You look a bit tired. Are you, are you holding up okay? You, you, you look a bit pale. Ah, Paris, the romance capital of planet Earth. This beautiful city has more familiar landmarks than any other city in Europe and people come to France from all over the world for romance and leisure. And in a setting like this, I would think that the furthest thing from people's minds is their need for a savior. And I think it's gonna be hard to get people thinking about eternity when they're so caught up in the pleasures of this beautiful place. But then again, it's kinda of hard to focus on pleasures when Mark Spence is standing in front of you, cutting off his arm. Ladies and gentlemen, Mesdames et messieurs, what you just saw was an illusion. C'était une illusion. The most important question you can ask yourself in this life <laughs> is, am I being deceived into believing that I know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die? Are you sure you know what's going to happen to you when you die? There's not a more important question to ask yourself. Because if there's one chance in a million that the Bible is true, then you owe it to your good senses to listen to what we have to say. Now yesterday we were in Amsterdam and Mark gave us a little lesson on how to draw a crowd. He likes to use sleight of hand to capture an audience with the goal of preaching the gospel to them. Now this is great, but not all of us are magicians. So if you're not an expert at sleight of hand, don't worry. There's another way to capture the attention of complete strangers. Just give away money. Can you imagine a preacher giving away money? Could anything be stranger than that? That'll draw a crowd for sure. Okay, folks, now we're gonna give away some money. Does anyone tell me what's the world's most popular drink? Alors, c'est quoi la boisson la plus populaire dans le monde? C'est quoi le soda? Who said wine? Whiskey. Who said wine? Whiskey. Whiskey. Is it whiskey? The world's most popular drink? Coffee. Yeah. Whiskey. Water, man. Water, man. It's not water. Come on. Coffee. Think there's a whole world out there. Hey, you're Oh, there you are, man. Give her a hand. What color is it? What color? What's the most popular New Year's resolution? To 
lose weight. Come and get your money. Give her a hand, folks. Where are you from? Steve. Yeah, Bob's your uncle. You've been trying so hard. Okay, who wants to go for the big money? You want to go for 20 bucks? Because you're a good person? Okay, if you prove to be a good person, I'll give you the rest of this. If you, if you don't prove to be a good person, I'll give you one as a consolation prize. First question, have you ever told a lie? What do you call someone who tells lies? Liar. Have you ever stolen something? What do you call someone who steals things? Thief. Okay. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Several times. One more out of these questions. This one will make your mouth go dry. <laughs> Jesus said whoever looks at a woman and lusts after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? All the time. All the time. Now listen to this. By your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, you got to turn team. And you have to face God on Judgment Day. Now here's the question. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on the Day of Judgment, do you think you'd be innocent or guilty? Guilty. Would you go to heaven or hell? Heaven. for a minute. Heaven. Why? Because he'll forgive me. Are you sure? I'll ask for forgiveness. Would you bet your life on it? Because you are. Think of this. A man stands in front of a judge and he's committed serious crimes. Rape and murder. And he says, Judge, I know I'm guilty, but I know you'll forgive me. He's not going to let you go. If he's a good judge, he's bound by the laws of justice. He must see that justice is done. And it's the same with God. God is good and he's just and holy. And asking for forgiveness cannot save you from hell. But you know what God did so you wouldn't have to go to hell? Jesus suffered and died on the cross for your sins. He took your punishment upon himself. And what you've got to do is repent and trust the Savior. Do you have a Bible at home? Has it got some dust on it? No. Yeah, quite a bit. Quite a bit. You got to dust it down because there's nothing more important than eternal salvation. Thanks for listening. Here is a dollar for you. You're not a good person. You're like the rest of us. One of the great aspects of open-air preaching is that it's a great environment for talking about spiritual things. People are already listening to the gospel. It's already on their mind. So it's a very easy way to get into one-to-one -one conversation about spiritual things. On ne peut pas savoir qui ira ou qui n'ira pas au ciel. Qui se permet de juger? I can't judge. Only God can judge. And God has told us what his standard is. Who gets to go to heaven? It is not wrong for me or for you to say that rape is wrong. It is okay to make that judgment. It is okay to say murder is wrong because God says that it's wrong. But God also says that lying is wrong and stealing is wrong and adultery is wrong. So therefore, if you have broken God's commandments, you can't go to heaven. But I've broken God's commandments. Have you? Of course. So what do we do? How do we get to heaven? We broke his commandments. Smile to the life. Smile to life. Good, but wrong. 2,000 years ago, God became a man. His name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on a cross for all those who will repent and place their faith in him. It's like this. You broke God's law, but Jesus paid the fine. So you have to repent and place your faith in Jesus, and you're given the gift of everlasting life. Thank you very much. Todd Friel, our historian on the go, has managed to meet up with the team again. With all the travel going on, the different teams are like ships passing in the night. Let's see what Todd's been up to. Behind me is the world's most famous art museum, the Louvre, and it is loaded with wonderful, great pieces of old art. But have you noticed how goofy the modern stuff looks these days? I mean, some artist takes a can of paint and slaps it on some canvas, and we're supposed to interpret it and ask, what does the art say to me? Forget what the artist intended. We're asked to simply respond. And the reason for that new approach to interpreting art is a big fancy word called deconstructionism. 
Frenchman Jacques Derrida spent a lot of time in French coffee houses and cafes where he created a new way to read books. He said, we need to deconstruct literature. I know that sounds weird, but it is weird. It's sort of like a wrecking crew who tears down a house piece by piece to discover what the builder did wrong. Deconstructionists teach it doesn't matter what the author wrote. What matters is what the literature means to me. The author must die that the reader might live. That's what they said. And if you think that's just highfalutin philosophical talk, it's not. You've actually seen deconstructionism at work. Here's where you've seen it. You go to a Bible study and the teacher asks, what does that verse say to you? That's deconstructionism inside the church. When it comes to reading the Bible, it doesn't matter what it says to me. What matters is, what did the author intend it to say? And that's why we shouldn't ask, what does the verse say to me? We should ask, what does the verse say? And how does that truth apply to me? But thanks to deconstructionism, we have some really bad art and some really bad Bible studies. There are so many colorful people here in Paris. I'd like to get some interviews. All I need now is someone who speaks good English. Alan, can we have permission to show this interview on national television? Uh, thank you. Good morning. My name is Alan. Uh, I love uh, this uh, TV show. I very like. Yeah. <laughs> I like American people. All time, all day. Yes, I'm looking here. What do you think happens when someone dies? Where do they go? Is there an afterlife? Yes, this is my life. Because is there because an afterlife after people die? Is there yeah. a heaven? Uh, sorry? Is there a heaven? Yeah, this is heaven. There is a heaven? Yeah. <laughs> this is heaven. This is heaven. Yes, uh, all time uh, I, I love people. Yes, because this is special, special place. And God, this is my boss, God. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to heaven? Yes. Are you a good person? Yeah. Have you kept the Ten Commandments? Uh, I don't understand. The Ten Commandments? You shall not kill, shall not steal, shall not lie. Have you kept the Ten Commandments or have you broken them? Yes. Well, thank you very much for talking to me. Okay, thank you. I thank you. Thank you. We got a million dollars for Alan? There's a million. Wow, million. Thank you. Thank you. I'm rich. Very rich. <laughs> what do you think happens after someone dies? Where do they go to? Oh, after someone dies, um, he becomes somebody like a wind. Like or a wind? Get, a wind, or he gets uh, reincarnated. I think uh, we are maybe reborn as animals, like that, or because uh, I feel... What were you in the last life? An animal? Maybe. Why not? What sort of animal? Um, I like uh, cats very much and I feel very connected with them and maybe I was a cat. Well, say so she comes back as a dog. You can have also a dog in a, in a human being, you know. You have some people that behave like dogs, really. <laughs> if you use most of the time your dark side, you're going to have a bad karma and you're going to be reincarnated as a pig for, or a dog. <laughs> I think it's uh, important how you behave in your first life. And if you behave good, you come back uh, as a high animal. And if you behave bad... Like a giraffe? <laughs> no, no, like a... Um, maybe like a dog or something. Reincarnation is the teaching that after death, the soul goes to a holding place and then enters a new human body. Some even believe we are incarnated into animals, plants, and even inanimate objects. This cycle continues over and over again for thousands of years until the person supposedly learns what he or she is supposed to learn. It works with karma. The idea that your past lives of goodness and badness affects the quality and the position of your next incarnation. Well, that might sound good, but it makes no sense. Think about it. If this is true, then each person had a first incarnation. That means that each person then had perfect karma since he had no previous life in which he had done anything wrong. So if he had perfect karma and he didn't learn what he was supposed to learn during his first life, what makes him think that after hundreds, if not thousands of incarnations with accumulated bad karma, that he's now gonna be able to achieve the perfect state of union with this divine consciousness? And then there's the issue of final authority. When it's time to reincarnate, 
who or what is the cosmic authoritative figure that gets to decide whether or not you've been good or bad. These religions, by and large, have no God who judges, nor a gauge by which we are judged by. It's like having a justice system with no judge. It makes no sense. The deception of reincarnation is that there is no day of judgment, no need for the cross, and no need to trust in Christ. Aside from Jesus, no one has ever been perfect. Because of this, no one could ever be good enough to escape the supposed cycle of reincarnation. After death, we face judgment, meaning there is no second chance. That's why you need a savior today. On the day you die, you will not go back to the end of the line to try again. You're going to be judged. And without the righteousness of Christ, you don't stand a chance. Okay, the team is rolling up to the famous Notre Dame, a very popular tourist site with a whole lot of people. An American sister happens to be in town, and she's willing to translate for us. We're heading toward Notre Dame, which is a huge memorial, very famous, but if you look at the top up, there's a whole stack of demons sticking their head down. Now, the Notre Dame Cathedral is considered by many to be one of the finest examples of French Gothic architecture in all of Europe. Nice church. All we need now is a preacher. Let me speak to you for a moment. If you look behind me, you'll see Jesus and the apostles. What was Jesus Christ all about? The Bible says, never man spoke like this man. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Your whole eternity depends on what you do with this one man, Jesus Christ. The Bible says Jesus is the savior of the world. The Bible says he came to save his people from their sins. Maybe you don't think you have any sin, but all you have to do is look at the Ten Commandments for one moment. Have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? If you say yes, then you're a lying thief. If you have sinned, then you're chained to death. You are chained to hell. Because God will punish murderers and rapists. But he's so good, he'll punish thieves and liars. That God is rich in mercy and sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take the punishment for your sins. I'm sure that the last thing people expect to find when they visit the famous Notre Dame is an open-air preacher but they're listening and for that I'm thankful. I'm also thankful for Scotty and for the fact that he has a heckler that always brings an extra element to the preaching. You believe in a book that was assembled by 10 different people, modified over hundreds of years. The Bible was written by 40 different authors, 66 different books over a period Men. of 15 years. You read the passage through it if you read it. I, I've read some of it, yeah. What is the main theme that passes through the Bible? Oh, if you want to talk about the main theme, has, has Catholicism and Christianity, have Christians really been Christian? I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about the Bible. Okay, the Bible. But these are the people who follow the Bible. And they've slaughtered millions in, in the name of... I'm talking about people. I'm talking about God. But it's all people. People wrote the Bible. God wrote the Bible. No, God himself did not come down and write the book and then print it out. It was written by people, printed by people. No, you've written a letter, haven't you? That's the same. Did God himself actually come down Answer and write the, the Bible? Did you written the letter? Yes. Did you use a pencil to write the letter? Yes. Would you say the pencil wrote the letter? No, I say I wrote the letter. The, you're the mind, the inspiration behind it. And just so, God wrote the Bible and he used men as pens to write it. It foretells the future. It's 100% accurate. Archaeology has never, ever shown any evidence of anything against it. It's 100% accurate because it is from the hand of the one who created it. So, you believe the world is about 4,000 years old? I don't know how old it is. I've never found a date on it. All the scientific evidence that we have contradicts that. No, Everything we know no, in our minds... We're not talking about young Earth or old Earth. You'd love to talk about those things because what I've said pricks your conscience. What I'm talking about is evidence you have in your own mind, well, in your own thoughts, that convicts you of sin. The world is not used to seeing believers boldly proclaim their faith publicly, as we do in open-air preaching. And it can seem offensive at first, so complaints from unbelievers should be expected. 
But surprisingly, we sometimes get complaints from Christians as well. They say, you're being unloving. You're pushing people away. Jesus wasn't like that. Well, to them, Jesus is this gentle, meek and mild lamb who never would have raised his voice or said anything offensive. But they seem to have missed some of what he said. Jesus was loving and kind more than any man. But he also said things like this. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Do not think I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You are of your father, the devil. Jesus warned his disciples that men would hate them for the things they would preach. The truth is, far from being inoffensive, Jesus so offended the religious leaders of his time that they ultimately crucified him for the things that he said. It's not our goal to be offensive, but the open proclamation of the gospel is always offensive to those who love their sin. If we love them as Christ loved them, we won't lower the standard to spare their feelings, no. We'll lift it high to help them see how terrible their offenses are in the eyes of Almighty God, that His wrath abides on the guilty who will be judged and punished in the lake of fire forever. When people understand the true nature of their crimes, then and only then can they understand the true love of God who gave His Son Jesus Christ to die in their place so they could go free. It's the knowledge of our sin and understanding the punishment we deserve that makes the grace of God so amazing. Yeah, some people will get upset with the message and the messenger, but others will thank you for caring enough to preach the truth. I can't tell you how many times people have come up and said, thank you for what you're doing. You know, John Wesley did a bit of open-air preaching in his time. And according to him, when you preach, your hearers should either get angry or get converted. Let's stop worrying about pleasing men and start pleasing God by preaching the gospel biblically. I got a scenario for you. You're taken back to 1939. You've got a high-powered rifle. Adolf Hitler is in your sights. Do you take him out? Hmm. Why would you hesitate? Are you because afraid? I'm, because I'm taking a life. You're taking a life, but he's going to take six million. But you leave judgment for God. Really? That's what I believe for yeah. the most part. So you believe there's going to be a judgment day? Yes. I don't believe in anything. I just acknowledge the fact that there's no way I can possibly know what happens after the position I'm in right now. Do you think other people can know? No. So you know what everybody knows? I don't understand. Well, if, that if, we, if we say nobody knows what happened after you die, that means we know what everybody else knows. All we can say is, I don't know, but someone else might know. And so it's good to be open because you could find out something about the most important issue. Do you ever think about your death? I, I do. Uh, I, I just don't really think that I think any, I don't really think anything about it. You Are know. you afraid of dying? Yes. What about the Ten Commandments, God's standard? How do you, have, you, have you kept those? Now and then. <laughs> now and then. <laughs> I respect the Ten Commandments. You haven't broken them? Never. Have you lied? Sometimes just, just to defend myself. Sometimes you have to lie to defend yourself. You know? Just to defend yourself? You to defend yourself. Against the truth? So you, get, uh, no. you said you believe in a heaven, but no hell? I'm not sure about heaven. I don't believe in hell. Do you think God should punish a man like Hitler who murdered uh, six million Jews as well as blacks and gypsies? He just, should God just say, well, never mind. Well, don't you think that not getting into heaven if it exists is enough? I mean, I don't think if so. you just stay in your body and nothing happens, like if you just decompose in the ground, that's not But bad. even, even uh, in our civil courts, if someone commits a terrible crime, we don't say, oh, you're going to feel guilty for the rest of your life. We make sure the guy's punished because we, even as human beings, believe in retribution. You have to lie to the liar. When you lie to the liar, then you, be, you become truthful than the liar. Oh, stop it. <laughs> The word puritanical is often used in a derogatory sense. The dictionary tells us that it's derived from the 16th century Puritans who strove to live pure lives 
free from the sins of this world. Sadly, few could call many contemporary professors of faith puritanical. One major reason for this is that most who profess to love God don't fear Him enough to obey Him. If the pure character of God was thundered from the pulpits, it would result in the awakening of many false converts who sit within our churches. In survey after survey, researchers find that the lifestyles of Christians are virtually indistinguishable from those of non-believers. The divorce rate among Christians is identical to that of non-believers. Pornography, materialism, gluttony, lust, covetousness, and even disbelief are commonplace in many of our churches. Actually, the category of the lukewarm Christian doesn't exist. We can't be tepid both towards God and towards the unsaved. We should either be hot or cold. In truth, lukewarm converts are not part of the body of Christ. They merely weigh heavy within the stomach of his body until, as the Bible says, he vomits them out of his mouth on the day of judgment. They didn't pass through the jagged edged teeth of the law of God. They remain hard and impenitent. They were never broken by the law that they might be absorbed into the bloodstream of the body of Christ. They never felt the heartbeat of God so that their hands would reach out with compassion to the lost. This mass of converts is like the backslider in heart who's filled with his own ways rather than the ways of God. The here I am Lord send him doesn't come from a fear of man but from rebellion to the revealed will of the God they call Lord and King. Perhaps you're realizing you've been lukewarm or have played the hypocrite. No one could ever accuse you of being puritanical. You haven't been living godly in Christ Jesus. You've been a stranger to biblical holiness. And it could be that if you died today, you'd hear Jesus say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Then get things right with God today. Repent and trust the Savior now. You may not have tomorrow. Hey, do you believe what I'm telling you? Yeah, I do. I think I knew it. Yeah. It's just that you don't address it every day. You haven't appropriated it. So right. give some serious thought to what we talked about. And thanks for talking to me. We're going to Monaco. We're going to the train. Bus, bus, then the train. And then a taxi, and then two more buses, and then we're off to the train. The team will be in Monaco tomorrow. Now, just so you know, we've contacted the palace and found that their restrictions are so tight, it looks like there's no way we're going to be able to open air preach in Monaco. So knowing that's the case, the team is on their way. This should be exciting. And don't forget, 150,000 people die every 24 hours. So go share your faith while you still have time. this episode of Wave the Master has inspired you to share the message of eternal life. You can watch our award-winning movies such as The Atheist Delusion freely on our website, where you'll also find articles, videos, and audio messages, as well as books, DVDs, gospel tracts, and other resources to help you share your faith biblically and effectively. Make sure to visit livingwaters.com today.